Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church, the show where we sift through the flotsam and jetsam of the last week in the Vatican beat and try to lift up those few nuggets of gold. It has been a tumultuous week because Pope Francis has just wrapped up one of the most remarkable trips in the entire history of the papacy, a trip to Mongolia, one of the most improbable destinations for any pope in history. And as we sort through the prelude, the content, and the aftermath of that trip, what emerges is that we have basically a tale of four nations. We begin with Mongolia itself. This is one of the most sparsely populated territories on earth. And it is, in a sense, the apotheosis of one of the defining features of the Francis papacy, which is a passion for the peripheries, this pope's drive to bypass established centers of power and reach out to the forgotten, neglected, and often marginalized corners of the earth. We'll explain the importance of all of that. Second, then, is Mongolia's great neighbor to the south, China. It was abundantly clear throughout this trip that Pope Francis was using his geographical proximity to China to deliver a series of messages to the Chinese people and also the Chinese government. And basically, what it amounted to is the Pope doubling down on his policy of an outstretched hand to China and rejecting criticism that he is excessively soft on issues such as China's human rights and religious freedom record. So we'll unpack all of that. Third, then, is China's great neighbor to the north, Russia. This trip began amid a furor over Pope Francis's recent comments on Great Mother Russia and whether that was or was not an exercise in imperialist propaganda. We'll explain the controversy and also what Pope Francis had to say about it. And then finally, ladies and gentlemen, there is the United States of America. Immediately before this trip, a controversy had erupted around comments that the Pope had made regarding certain kinds of Catholics in the United States and kind of the bone he has to pick with them. He doubled down on all of that on the flight on the way to Mongolia. We will also explain what's going on there and why the occasional pokes in the eye that Pope Francis delivers to America and Americans are, in a sense, a kind of backhanded tribute. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, in the name of all that is holy, don't go anywhere. Stay where you are. I will be right back. So, notoriously, intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. It is actually possible to be incredibly smart and also incredibly foolish. Footnote, it is also possible to be a total idiot and a great fool. My life is sort of a laboratory experiment in what happens when both of those things are true. But that's not our point here today. Our point here today is that history is replete with examples of the great mischief that can result when intelligence and wisdom become decoupled. If you want a refresher course in this point, by the way, I recommend you go see the brilliant new movie Oppenheimer, which is basically a three-hour meditation on precisely this point. However, the contrary is also true. That is, if disaster is often the result when intelligence and wisdom separate, triumph and amazement is often what happens when intelligence and wisdom come together. And this is a roundabout setup for a naked commercial plug because I'm here today to recommend a new piece of technology to you. It's a new app called Magisterium AI. And basically, it is an effort to combine intelligence, in this case, artificial intelligence, with the great spiritual and ethical wisdom of Catholic teaching. It is an app that is by now trained on more than 3,000 official church documents. It is available in 10 languages, so pretty much any tongue you would, you know, wish to get an answer in. And what you can do is you can go on to this app and ask it questions, ranging from really high-end egg-headed stuff to, like, explain the doctrine of transubstantiation or what were the issues in the Arian heresy, all the way down to the kinds of banal things that real people would ask, like, what's the deal with the Pope? Or... You know, the Virgin Mary, do you guys worship her? Like, what's the thing? 
you know, whatever your question is, this tool will give you cogent, insightful, well-written answers. So whether you are a priest who needs talking points for a homily, or you're a CCD teacher who has that one precocious kid in class that won't stop asking you questions, and speaking as the former precocious kid in class, I know how a annoying that slice of life can be. I raised it to a fine art. You know, whatever, you know, whatever your needs may be. I mean, if you're just an ordinary person with questions about the Catholic Church, because, I don't know, you read a Dan Brown novel or you watched Godfather 3 or whatever it is, this tool will be extraordinarily useful to you. It is the brainchild of our friends at Longbeard. That's a digital marketing and design company. They are the IT backbone of the Crux site and also of last week in the church. These people are geniuses. And beyond that, they're also salt of the earth, great people. And so whatever they touch basically turns to gold. This is the latest example of it. I highly recommend it to you. Now, I'm not going to promise that if you, you know, use it, and by the way, you should, it's at magisterium.com. That's magisterium.com. I'm not going to promise you a full refund if you're not satisfied because it's free. So you don't actually have to pay anything. What I will promise is that if you don't like it, you are free to send me a note telling me that. I will use another AI app to generate an automated response in which I have no rule whatsoever. I'm actually just kidding. I would pass your response along because I guarantee you the people at Longbeard want to get this right. So again, check it out. That is Magisterium AI online at magisterium.com. By the way, if this didn't convince you, and frankly, it's me, so why should it convince you? But if you want a more intelligent presentation of the argument for this, read my wife Elise's article on the Crux site. It is replete with insight and elan and verve, and it will lay out the case in very compelling fashion. Magisterium.com. Check it out. All right, everybody. Listen, happy Wednesday to you. Normally, this show drops on Tuesday, but today we're doing it on Wednesday. You might think that's because of the Labor Day holiday in the United States. Well, no, because here's the thing. When you are a foreign correspondent for an American news organization, the reality is American holidays are not holidays wherever you are, so you still have to work. And the holidays wherever you are are not holidays in America, so you still have to work. But in this case, we are a day late, but definitely not a dollar short, because we wanted to wait until Pope Francis's trip to Mongolia was wrapped up so that we could bring you comprehensive coverage. By the way, I want you to soak in and absorb the jacket I am wearing, this beautiful gray blazer, which is 100% Mongolian cashmere, which my loving wife, Elise, who was on the papal plane covering this trip for Crux, brought back for me from the nation of Mongolia. So I am literally, ladies and gentlemen, today wearing the story that I am here to, to recount for you. So we begin with the, the question of why Mongolia? I mean, why in the world would Pope Francis choose to an 86-year-old pope who has been hospitalized twice this year, who has a, a history of health issues, why in the world would this pope decide to take, you know, whatever reservoir of energy he has left and devote it to a fairly demanding, you know, nine-hour flight to Mongolia and then four days in the country? Well, and it is a great question because, look, let's start with this. Mongolia, as I mentioned at the top of the show, is one of the most sparsely populated territories on Earth. It is actually the third most sparsely populated territory on Earth. If you ever want to settle a bar bit, number one is Greenland. Number two are the Falkland Islands, or, you know, if you're on the other side of that argument, the Malvinas. But whatever, Mongolia is third. Mongolia is a country where human beings are outnumbered by livestock 20 to 1. Okay, there is a population of 3 million people in Mongolia, and there's roughly 30, 60 million animals in the country. So, you know, it is totally reasonable to ask the question, why would a pope decide to go there? 
Well, look, I mean, the, the bottom line reality is that from the beginning, one of the hallmarks of the Francis Papacy, uh, you could almost argue the defining hallmark, but in any event, certainly one of them, is this outreach to the peripheries, that is a determination by this pope to say that the standard centers of power, whether they are in Western Europe or North America or other parts of the world, they already get plenty of attention, they get plenty of love from the global media and so forth. And so his determination has been to reach out to other corners of the planet, places that are typically overlooked, or forgotten about. I mean this both in a geographical and a sort of existential sense. This is very much a pope of the peripheries. To put it differently, this is a pope of the lost sheep. You know, you remember the famous parable in the New Testament about the shepherd who would forget about the 99 sheep in the flock and devote his energies to seeking out that one, that one sheep who was lost. That, by the way, is a particularly poignant metaphor for Mongolia because in Mongolia there are 3 million people but 30 million sheep. Of course, cashmere, the, the jacket I am wearing is actually made of the wool of sheep, so this is an evocative image, and this trip certainly confirmed it. This was Pope Francis saying, if I can use the slightly off-color American image, size doesn't matter. He is determined to sort of give a moment in the sun, give a moment on the global stage to communities, peoples, places that in general we don't think about and frankly don't really care that much about. And this is the Pope grabbing us by the scruff of the neck and saying, for these four days, by God, you're going to pay attention. And so over the course of this trip, you know, we heard him talking about the dignity of the Mongolian people. We heard him talking about the inherent and intrinsic spirituality of the Mongolians living on these vast steps in this immense territory where, you know, they are surrounded by mountains and lakes and deserts and, you know, where they are cheek by jowl with nature and talking about how the image of God as living water in that context has a particular kind of resonance. You know, this was Pope Francis inviting us to step outside for a moment of our usual frameworks and our usual ways of seeing reality and to take on board the experience and the perspectives of this small but enormously important community of people. Well, let me just add that one of the remarkable things about this trip is that the entire Catholic community in Mongolia numbers fewer than 1,500 people. I mean, we are talking about, the conventional estimate is about 1,450 Catholics, which means this may well be the first papal trip in history in which by the time it was over, Pope Francis actually, physically, was cheek by jowl with every single Catholic in this country. It is entirely possible that every Mongolian Catholic had the opportunity to be at a papal event during the course of this trip. You know, if that's not outreach to the peripheries, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not quite sure what it would ever look like. I will make you this prediction, that whenever the end comes of the Francis papacy, and when those of us in my business are writing their obituaries or delivering their tributes in broadcast media. When they talk about this Pope's passion for the peripheries, they are going to lead with this trip to Mongolia. This was the emblematic, symbolic, metaphorical synthesis of one of the key elements of this papacy. All right. However, having said all of that, let me add, that it was not simply the peripheries which were at the heart of this voyage. It was also two global superpowers. We begin with China. To the south of Mongolia is the nation of China. They actually share portions of the Gobi Desert. And the border between Mongolia and China is the fourth largest land border in the world. 
And so by definition, the relationship between Mongolia and China is an extraordinarily important force. And further, this is undoubtedly as close to China as Pope Francis is ever going to get for a variety of political and diplomatic reasons. The Pope, this Pope anyway, is never going to make a trip to China itself. So this is as close as he will, as he will ever be. And there were some Chinese Catholics who were on hand, actually, for the Pope's presence in China, all of which made this a natural opportunity for the Pope to recapitulate, expand upon his approach to relations with China. Now, that approach has, of course, from the beginning, been controversial. The Vatican in 2018 signed a deeply controversial deal with Beijing regarding the appointment of Catholic bishops in the country. This is a deal that has been renewed twice, but in that, that span of time, those five years, has also been repeatedly violated by the authorities in Beijing who have appointed bishops without the consent of the Pope, despite the fact that that's what the deal envisions. And there were reminders of the tension in Vatican-Beijing relations around the contours of this trip. I mean, there were reports as Francis arrived in Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, that the Chinese Communist Party had denied permission for some bishops in China and some lay faithful to travel to Mongolia to see the Pope. There were also Chinese Catholics who were actually in Mongolia who were interviewed by reporters there, including my wife, Elise, who told these reporters that they were wearing COVID-era face masks not to, to protect themselves from disease, but to protect themselves from detection because they were worried that if their identity could be determined, then there would be blowback either from themselves or for their families back in China for the mere fact of their presence at a papal event. Now, for critics of the Pope's approach to China, what all of that means is that Pope Francis is going way too far to try to accommodate a regime that they would regard as brutal and authoritarian and as, in some ways, anti-Christian or anti-Catholic in terms of the suppression of the Christian presence in China, the Catholic pressure in China, Catholic presence, and more broadly, the issue of religious freedom in China. Now, however, throughout this trip, Pope Francis, both in word and deed, demonstrated that he simply is not buying that criticism. It began on the outbound flight from Rome to Ulaanbaatar with the Pope sending a telegram. He always sends telegrams to the heads of state of the countries he flies over. One of those telegrams, therefore, was to President Xi Jinping of China, in which he basically said that he expressed his admiration for the noble Chinese people and prayed for divine blessings to be showered upon the nation and its people. At one of his public events in Mongolia, he gave a shout out to Chinese pilgr pilgrims who were there, again praising the noble Chinese nation and calling upon Chinese Catholics to be both good citizens of China and also good Catholics. And then on the return flight, on the way back from Mongolia to Rome, when he took a question about China, he insisted that China has a very respectful relationship with the Catholic Church. And he used that phrase twice, very respectful, very respectful. He said China in many ways was quite open to the Christian and Catholic presence. He talked about Catholic scholars, for instance, who were invited to give courses in Chinese universities, and then said that relations between China and the Vatican are progressing, and the suggestion was in the right direction. Adding all this up, what you have is the clear evidence of a pope who understands that there is criticism of his outreach to China. There are a number of people, including a number of Catholics, who are frustrated that he will not more clearly call out Beijing for its human rights record, for instance, its treatment of its Uyghur minority and its track record on religious freedom, including its treatment of its Christian minority. But the Pope is playing the long game. Basically, he is betting 
that by showing respect, deference, and outreach to China, that over the long haul, that that will lead to an improved relationship and an ability to convince Chinese authorities that it is possible to be both a good citizen of China and also a good member of the Catholic Church. Whether that is how things are going to play out, none of us know. But if you need any proof that the Pope is not backing away from this olive branch policy, this trip certainly delivered it. All right, then we shift to Mongolia's great neighbor to the north, Russia. Before he left for Mongolia, Pope Francis had stirred controversy and not I'm saying that almost euphemistically, because the truth of it is, it was like poking a stick into a hornet's nest with a video call he had with Russian Catholic youth in St. Petersburg, where, among other things, he told these Russian Catholic youth that they were heirs to Great Mother Russia, that they were heirs to a great humanitarian and enlightened culture. And he encouraged them, for instance, to follow the example of Catherine II and Peter the Great, you know, these historically important leaders of Russia, and basically said that you need to carry this legacy forward as you make your way in life. Now, that kind of language obviously was destined to get some people upset. <laughs> and certainly in Ukraine, where... <laughs> The idea of Great Mother Russia is a little bit of a tough, tough sell right now because Russia is, of course, presently engaged in a brutal and bloody war of conquest in Ukraine. Ukrainians objected. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian government said that what the Pope was doing was basically recycling what he called Russian imperialist propaganda. Even the leader of the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine, that's the branch of the Catholic Church in Ukraine that is in full communion with Rome, Major Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk said out loud that the Pope's language had been a source of great pain and great concern for Catholics in Ukraine and went on to suggest that, you know, while the Pope basically should not talk like that, and in the United States, there was a, which is the great ally of Ukraine, of course, in its current struggle, there was a great deal of criticism. There was a piece in the Wall Street Journal, for instance, calling the Pope's language mind-boggling and flabbergasting and asking aloud, does he get it in terms of what's actually going on? Now, it's not as if the Pope is not aware of that criticism. And on the way back, from Mongolia to Rome. He got a question about it. And basically what he said was, look, I was not endorsing imperialism. I'm an opponent of imperialism. Imperialism is about the distortion of a culture into a political ideology, and I don't like that. But he said, on the other hand, there is a great Russian culture. And I suppose the money quote here is, he said, politics should not cancel Russian culture, which was an indirect way of saying that, you know, whatever you think about President Vladimir Putin or the policy he is pursuing in Ukraine, you know, nevertheless, there are a number of positive aspects about Russian culture. The Pope in particular, for instance, cited Dostoevsky and Russian literature that should not be forgotten. Now, look, once again, there are a number of critics of the Pope's attempt to be even-handed on the conflict in Ukraine, that is, to express sympathy for the humanitarian consequences of the war, but at the same time, not to explicitly condemn Russia or Putin in order to try to position himself as a potential mediator. A lot of people don't like that. The takeaway from the trip to Mongolia is that the Pope knows that people don't like it, but he is not going to capitulate to that. Once again, he has made it abundantly clear that this policy of an outstretched hand, this policy of an olive branch also to Russia, is going to continue. And, you know, the debate over that, I'm sure, will also continue as things play out. But the Pope has made it quite clear he is not changing course. Finally, then, we come to the United States of America. And by the way, those of you who are watching this show in the States, hope you had a great Labor Day holiday. Over Labor Day, if you are both American and Catholic, you may have been trying to digest the latest 
popal papal bromide when it comes to the United States. Just before he left to Mongolia, a transcript of a conversation he had had with members of his Jesuit order in Portugal when he was there earlier in the month was released. And in this transcript, one Portuguese Jesuit who had recently had a sabbatical in the United States asked Pope Francis about criticism of Francis in the United States, both from you know, just ordinary Catholics, but also from some bishops. Now, under other circumstances, you know, a pope might have handled that diplomatically. He might have said something like, well, you know, the church is universal. There is always space for different outlooks and different approaches. And I welcome the reactions of my American brother, something like that. That is not the course that Pope Francis chose. Instead, what he said was, yeah, it's true. There are some Catholics in the United States who are, well, what he said was backward-minded, that is, who were looking back rather than looking forward, who were stuck in the past rather than trying to get prepared for the future. He also said some American Catholics substitute ideology for faith, that is, they want to politicize the church, and he suggested they are not open to the idea of a legitimate development in doctrine, which he said is the authentic Catholic instinct. So the takeaway from all of this is the Pope was once again saying that some Catholics in the United States, and of course, I mean, he didn't use the word, but we all know he was talking about conservative Catholics in the United States, or at least some kinds of conservative American Catholics. Basically, he was saying that, you know, they just don't get it, that they are, you know, sticks in the mud, right? that they are focused too much on the past, not enough on the present and the future, and that they are basically political. That, you know, what they're really operating on is right-wing conservative ideology as opposed to the true teaching and principles of the Catholic faith. No big surprise, I suppose, that lots of American conservatives didn't like that. And we should also note that this statement from the Pope came in the context of two prominent American bishops, American Cardinal Raymond Burke and also Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler in Texas, recently in different ways saying out loud that the Pope's looming Synod of Bishops on Synodality here in Rome, which is set for next month, October, poses the risk of schism in the church if it contemplates changes in Catholic teaching on issues such as, well, I don't know, the blessing of, of same-sex unions, or, or pastoral outreach to the transgender community, or the relationship between Christianity and other world religions, or whatever it might be. So in that context, this statement by the Pope was received as pretty much a direct shot at American conservatives such as Burke and Strickland, and all those, you know, clergy and laity in the United States who might be inclined to be at least somewhat sympathetic to the kinds of criticisms that those two bishops were voicing. Now, that, as I say, aroused a kind of kerfuffle, a contretemps, a kind of mini tempest in American Catholic circles. And you might think that the next time the Pope had a bite at the apple, that is the next time that he could talk about this, that he might use that opportunity to kind of, you know, try to smooth the ruffled feathers, right? Try to calm things down. Bang! No, not at all. On the flight from Rome to Ulaanbaatar, an American reporter asked Pope Francis about these comments and the reaction of some American Catholics. And you know what the Pope said? Basically, he said is, yeah, I know some Americans got upset. They should move on. They should move on. You know, the word he used in Italian is andiamo avanti, avanti, meaning move forward, you know, basically get over it, okay? Not exactly the kind of thing you would expect from a global leader who was trying to mend fences and make people feel better. Now, here's the thing. Let us bracket off for a moment the question of whether the Pope is correct in his diagnosis 
of certain kinds of conservative American Catholics. And look, I mean, no doubt there are some conservatives in the Catholic community in the States who were a little stuck in the past, just as there are Catholic conservatives in many other parts of the world who were a little stuck in the past. On the other hand, it is probably also fair to say that it is possible to be a Catholic, whether in the United States or anywhere else, and ask questions about certain aspects of this Pope's agenda without necessarily being a dyed-in-the-wool traditionalist or a schismatic or an ideologue, right? Let's grant both of those points. Nevertheless, forgetting on all of that for a moment, I think the really interesting question is, why does Pope Francis, and for that matter, why do popes generally, why do Vatican officials generally feel free to publicly and openly criticize the United States and certain kinds of people in the United States in a way they never would, say, for example, with China and Russia? Well, because here's the thing. A pope knows that if he takes a poke in the eye against the Chinese government, then his flock in China might pay a price. Catholics might be arrested. Churches might be bulldozed, right? Bishops might be thrown into jail. You know, in Russia, if he takes a, a poke in the eye at Moscow, missionaries might be denied their visas. Churches might be shut down. You know, religious orders might be suppressed, and on and on. Popes also know that none of that is ever going to happen in the United States. In the United States, you know, whatever a particular government or whatever might think of what the Pope is saying or doing, the fact is that our tradition of religious freedom, the fact that Catholics constitute 25% of the American population, and the fact that religion plays such a vital role in public life in America, what all of that means is that we are never going to, we're never going to engage in the kind of payback against popes or Vatican officials that authoritarian regimes would. In other words, this is, in a way, a tribute to the climate of religious freedom in the United States. That may be cold comfort to those of you who feel singled out and blasted by the Pope. It is nevertheless true. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is, again, cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. I especially encourage you, if you haven't been following it, go on our site and check out my wife Elisa's coverage of the Pope's trip to Mongolia. It is comprehensive, erudite, and delivered with great verve and align. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week.